and welcome to Lex Education, the brand new podcast from comedian, author, star of Live at the Apollo, Mock the Week, Hypothetical and Roast Battle, Laura Lex, and her brother Ron. Hello, I'm Ron. In our brand new podcast adventure, science fan Ron tries to teach me, comedy queen Laura, enough science to pass a triple GCSE, with limited success. Each week, Ron and I will focus on one of the different science topics, alternating between biology, chemistry and physics. Each episode will feature one lesson and one quiz. However, the twist is that even though you will just hear a jingle between the lesson and the quiz, we will have lived a whole week in the real world. That way we really see what's stuck in my brain. Ron, the listeners came back. Welcome home, everyone. (laughs) That is so creepy. Welcome home. <laughs> the home in your ears that's like a school about science. Um, anyway, thank you so much for all your love and affection on the socials. Uh, if you are enjoying listening, do give us a follow on Twitter and stuff like that. And we want to give a big shout out to Pod Spike, who have really, really helped us launch this podcast. They uh, made all of the little images that we've been putting our sexy, cool, fun science facts onto that you've probably seen on the Twitter and the Instagram. And they've really helped us l- sort of learn how to how to be engaging on social media they, about a podcast before it's out. They kind of told us that, you know, we needed to post stuff and and we needed to post content that people would want to see. Yeah. So if you need any advice on launching a podcast, honestly, we can't say expressively enough how lovely um the people at Podspike are and how much they've helped us out. So do do head over and check them out. So that's your learning, but um now it's time for me to learn. <laughs> How you doing, Ron? Yeah, not bad. I'm very stressed. Um, why are you why are you stressed, Ronnie Honks? Uh, because we we're doing this podcast today. We're also playing uh, Dungeons and Dragons with our other siblings later on. Yeah, which I'm DMing for, and I've had a friend staying for the last couple of days, so I just haven't been able to do any of it. And then also had yesterday off work, so then I had to catch up with that today. Ah, oh, that is a busy day. I'm sorry, your life sucks. No, it's okay. It's still pretty good. Do you find it stressful, the thought of teaching me science? Uh, I had to do a lot of research because not a lot of the content today is actually in the syllabus. What? What do you mean? Why are we learning it if it's um, not in the syllabus? <laughs> Because I got really angry while I was uh, while I was researching it for, for, for reasons we'll talk about later. Mm-hmm. Um And, uh, yeah, I decided to go into extra detail on some stuff. Ron, I just don't know if that's the sensible approach to getting me to learn this. We all heard how badly I did at the quiz at the end of the previous episode. Ronnie Honks, last week we learned all about cells and cell structure. What are we doing today? So today we're going to learn a bit about the periodic table. Um, we're going to learn just a little bit about atoms and elements in general. Um, and then we're going to learn a lot about the history of atoms. Is is the history of atoms the bit that I don't need to know? Well, it depends how racist you're feeling today, Laura. Oh, God. Oh, God. I wasn't <laughs> expecting that. Um, like, not very? Or like oh, as... <laughs> then we should learn the history of, of atoms, Okay. Because it was very whitewashed and Western centric when I was doing my research, so I just felt like we should be a voice, voice for it. Okay. All right. I'm I'm keen for that. Let's go. All right. Begin learning. Okay. Cool. So first thing that they want us to learn about um, about the periodic table is that each of the squares on it, it represents an element. Elements are made of atoms, and each element is represented by a different chemical symbol. E.g., O represents oxygen, Na represents sodium, stuff like that. You've probably seen things like this before. They say that an atom is the smallest part of an element that can exist. So I thought we'd do a fun little quiz at the beginning of the show. No, that's um, not fair. The quiz comes after I've learned it. 
I thought this would really annoy you. Yeah. Um, so we're going to quiz you on some elemental symbols. Oh, okay. So um, the first one, do you know what C is? Calcium. No. Carbon! It's carbon! It is carbon. Nice, but that's zero points because you said Nah, nah. I need to have a margin of error. All right, okay, one point. Um, what about CO? Cobalt. Oh, nice. C U. Yeah. CU. CU. Um, silver. No, that one's copper. Uh, I was thinking copper. Um, the next one, PB. Oh, that's lead. How do you know all of these? Because if you're in the lead, you've got your personal best. Wow. Uh, what about HG? Uh, hobgoblin. Mercury. Oh. <laughs> no, that's just stupid, isn't it? We might have to cut that because I thought you were going to do a lot worse. Uh, it's. Uh, I, 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 Hang on I, a minute. What? We're cutting it because I was good at it. Yeah, because now it's going to, you know, the, the premise of the, the podcast is that you're bad at things. No, I think the premise is I'm genuinely trying my best. <laughs> the, the premise is just <laughs> the vague concept of earnestness. <laughs> yeah. Next thing that the syllabus wants us to know, it wants you to know the first 20 elements and just to be able to name those. Oh, piss and off. Why? Just because they're they're just as a memory exercise, I think. So I figured let's not do that. Okay. Because I think you just reeling off elements yeah. um, isn't isn't fascinating audio content. And then specifically, they want us to know the elements from groups one and seven, um, which makes no sense because group one is super interesting. These are super reactive metals that literally explode when they touch water. Um, really, really cool. Group seven. Just a bunch of random metals, like manganese and stuff. Um, which is why I assume they want you to learn, actually want you to learn group 17, which is like halogens, um, which actually come up and is like chlorine and iodine and stuff. Um, but yeah, so periodic table, what do you think you know about it? Um, I know the noble gases go in a club together. Can you name any of those? Argon? Yes. Neon? Yes. Helium? Yes. And I think, are the noble gases quite unreactive? Yeah. They're like super stable. Unreactive. Yeah, because um, they've got all of their electrons. Yeah. So I know that the, in my head they're all on the right hand side, but I don't know if that's right. Um, that is correct. Then, Do you know why the periodic table is organised in the way that it is? No, not in the slightest. So it's simultaneously organised by properties of the atoms okay. and uh, their electron structure, because it is their electron structure that gives them these properties. So the further right you go, the more electrons... You scream at Keir Starmer that he's a paedophile defender. Anyway, yeah, so the further right you go, um, the more electrons are in the outer ring of electrons, essentially, that, um, that the atom has. So by the time you get to your noble gases that we spoke about before, they're all full up. So they're not very reactive because, you know, they're kind of content. Right, hang on like, a minute. I think, I think for the sake of my brain, we need to reverse a little bit because you're starting okay. to say things about electrons being in the outer ring and I'm like, what are you chatting about? Sure, okay. Let's go back to the beginning of atoms. Yeah. <laughs> Apologies to anyone that's reading along the syllabus as we go. They can't teach it uh, like that. They can't be like, listen, all these ones over here have got a full up ring full of electric when what is what's the ring? What's an electron? What are you talking about? I must admit that that's not actually in the syllabus. I was just talking about it because it's interesting. <laughs> I've been found out. <laughs> Stop trying to slip interesting stuff in here. I want the basics and nothing more. 
Okay. What is your understanding of the structure of an atom? It's a circle. I believe it has a ring of electrons <laughs> around the outside. Uh, yeah, around the nucleus. It's got a nucleus, so it's a cell. Yeah. It's a eukaryote. Is it? No, oh. it's an atom, not a cell. But it's got a nucleus. Yeah, nucleus just means like the, the centre of something. Oh, that's good information. Okay, so um, I the only thing I vaguely remember about this is that electrons like to grab onto each other in pairs or something. So that's how you make bonds and stuff. Is the pairs all match up? Yeah, yeah, pretty much. Which is, yeah, exactly. So then when I was talking about the noble gases, all of their pairs are full, so they don't need to make bonds with them. Gotcha. But anyway, we'll come back to it. So let's talk about the history of atomism, which usually I think we'd skip because, you know, science podcast, not a history podcast. I love history. But... Exactly. A, that, and B, the reason why they want the kids to learn it is to learn about the scientific method. Um, and there's a lot of people in the world who really fucking need to hear about the scientific method. Um, because if Ron's you don't not blinking, understand... Th- just so that those people listening at home know, um, it's gone so serious all of a sudden, like... You might find him in Speaker's Corner on a box shouting this to passers-by. Oh, man. Well, this is just how things like anti-vax people come about when they don't understand stuff like this. So I thought it would be interesting to go into. Okay, yeah, I'm excited. How ideas build on each other. Yeah, okay. So, when do you think... If you had to guess, when would you reckon that the first person came up with the idea of an atom? Um, let's guess sometime around, like, the Enlightenment, I'm going to guess, like, your your 1820s. No, what if I told you it was in the 8th century BCE? Holy crap, what? Yeah, right? 800 BCE? Yeah. Oh, is this one of those things where a Persian dude worked it out and everybody's just never talked about it because nobody wrote it down in English? Well, kind of yes and no. So basically, um, this is Indian philosophy. Um, uh, The works of the Vedic sage Aruni lived in the 8th century BCE in India. He came up with the... um, the, uh, the idea that everything is made of particles too small to be seen that mass together into substances and uh, give us experiences in the world. He called mm. them karna, not atoms. But that's pretty close. Is that where you um, say I've got carnal knowledge? Like, I know your atoms. It just might be. It's probably uh, not. It's probably not, no. Um, and then they had a couple of different schools of thought. Um... Uh, over the next couple of centuries, mainly arguing over how many different uh, atoms there were. They're either four to represent the four different uh, base elements, fire, water, wind, and all that stuff, mm-hmm. um, or 25. <laughs> Didn't get any information on what the 25 were. <laughs> it's either four or it's nine billion. <laughs> that kind of makes um, sense, though, to me. It's like it's either they're all different or they're all the same. Bye. <laughs> Um, and then a few hundred years later, the Greeks start talking about it. And then there is just so much more information on the Greek schools of thought on this stuff. Not the Indian stuff that happened three year, uh, 300 years beforehand. Which is kind of why I wanted to talk about this. Because like in the same Wikipedia article that I was um, uh, reading, it said uh, Leucippus... Um, is widely renowned as the person that invented atoms. And then, like, three paragraphs later, it said that someone in India did it three centuries before. So yeah. I thought it was worth mentioning. Yeah. So this guy, Leucippus, um, that's definitely not how you pronounce his name, <laughs> and his pr- pupil, Democritus, they proposed that all matter was composed of small, indivisible particles called atoms that had empty space in between them. Okay. Which... Up until, like, the 20th century, we, you know, we, we, that was true. 
that's what we knew about it. Hmm. Um, the way it was explained to me when I first learned about this stuff, the, the thought experiment that they did that led to them working this out was they just asked themselves, what would keep happening if, uh, what would happen if you just keep, kept snapping a branch in half? And eventually they just came, they, like, they somehow thought, well, you couldn't keep snapping it forever, so eventually you must reach the smallest thing. And then that's where the idea of atoms came from. Yeah, and then they had the idea that the properties of the um, of the substance were um, corresponded to the shape of the atoms involved. So they thought that iron atoms were solid and strong, and they had hooks that locked them all together, and that water atoms were smooth and slippery mm. um, and slipped past each other, and salt atoms, because of their taste, were sharp and pointed. Um, yeah, that's and, and fun. That stuff. makes sense to my brain brain yeah which um you know like it, it's while it's not true and you know iron atoms don't have hooks and stuff the shape of the atom does give it its properties so like they really weren't far off um so middle ages um i found this 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 breakdown very funny um so medieval hindu philosophers uh obviously they took the um the indian philosophy that we uh we we're talking about before built upon it they were saying that everything you experience is the result of aggregation of the atoms and the interplay between them which is basically Ooh. true so kind of like um oh what's that thing where water has memory like that like you're made of um homeopathy, homeopathy. yeah the atoms in you are the experiences do you want to know what the medieval buddhists thought like not really but we should probably carry on um, the medieval Buddhists considered atoms to be point-sized, I have no size to be like a point in space, durationless, which I don't understand, but they also said that they are made of energy, which I found super interesting, because we're talking like pre-1000 AD here, and like the idea that atoms and you know matter is made of energy is basically Einstein's theory of relativity, but without the equation. So Einstein ripped off the Dark Ages. All right, Einstein, I'm taking your photo off the wall. Then medieval Muslims, um, they decided that theirs had to be a bit more God-focused um, because all of these ideas were pretty heretical at the time um, because you're kind of like, you stop yawning when I'm talking about... <laughs> I'm listening! <laughs> Maybe we should have made a podcast about something you found more interesting. No, no, no. I'm into it. I'm like, listen, the Dark Ages knew where it was at. They are mini, mini Einsteins wandering around. Now we've got some Muslim dudes. They've turned up. They're making it a religious thing, as religion yeah. does. So my understanding of the medieval Muslim philosophy of atoms was that atoms are the only permanent thing in the universe. And then God kind and of... And a mother's love. Um, and God kind of does things with the atoms and that's how you experience anything so he's just got a load of atoms and then he Legos them hey Lego is very helpful in this podcast so far Lego's back 50 points to Lego this week Lego is God's plaything and you're made of them Um, and then um, I liked that just Christendom decided to just ignore the idea of atoms for 15 centuries Nah, wrong. Yeah. Nope. No, my God. Oh, he wouldn't play with an atom. Are you joking? He no. plays with whole people and nothing else. When he you just zoom in, it's just tiny gods. Yeah. He he just snaps his fingers and there's a tiger. So then there was the Renaissance, um, and in Italy and England is basically just a bunch of white people catching up with what the rest of the world has been talking about for 1,500 years. Yeah, um, writing it down real nice and taking all the Yeah, time. writing it down nice, kind of formalising it. Um, Using and like, Gutenberg you know, to print it around, get the knowledge exactly. out. Exactly. Hammering it on some doors and stuff, having Woo! a good time. Also, they've got good boats, the s- so they can drive around saying, look, we're good at this. Yeah, look at these atoms. Um, The syllabus actually wants us to start with The Discovery of the Electron by J.J. Thompson. I've read that. It's very good. It's about the feminist movement in Vienna post-war. Yes, J.J. Thompson, very Austrian name. Yeah, J.J. J.J. 
That's a yay yay. No, that would be a y, wouldn't it? Yay yay. Yay yay to son. Mm. Je suis love pastries. Again, very Austrian. <laughs> um, he theorised something called the plum pudding model. Mmm, and this was a model who really let herself go eating plum pudding. And, <laughs> and everybody said to her, no more modelling jobs for you. And then she had to get a boyfriend because this was the past and, and women couldn't support themselves. And that is how they discovered that electrons like to come in pairs. Basically, in the plum pudding model... Um, the, the idea is Don't that... Don't call uh, your ap- model a plum pudding model. That must be gutting, because this fellow would have been a clever scientist, right? And now he's gone down in history, plum pudding model. Like, at some point in your draft, you've well, he, guaranteed he's got plum pudding model, brackets, working title, JJ, come up with something better than this before it goes to press. And then that's never happened, and now the poor sod has gone down in history with the fucking plum pudding model. Einstein's theory of relativity, and how about you, JJ? Um, don't worry about what mine's called. Here's what it is, though. <laughs> no, no, we need the title. Hmm. Yeah, but this guy, model? you know, this guy was born in uh, in England in, like, 1846 or something. Oh, so, like, plum, plum pudding was good. Up the the throbbing stump he must have had on every time he thought about plum puddings. Throbbings. So this is like going like, ah, oh, it's the it's the Tesla Mark Three of puddings and science theories. The idea is that atoms are a hodgepodge ball of like negatively charged electrons, the bit that he's just uh, discovered, um, and posit- in a positively charged medium, so to quote Wikipedia, like negatively charged plums embedded in a positively charged pudding. <laughs> I, did a, I did a little burp after I said that. <laughs> You're so excited about plum pudding. Okay, so he thinks that there's negative electrons and they're like stuck in dough. Yes. A positive yes, exactly. atom, and, and that's holding the electrons into the pudding is the negative positive charge. Yeah, so atoms are neutral, but we found out that there are electrons in them. So because electrons are negatively charged, therefore they must be within something positively charged to cancel out and make them neutral overall. Okay, so atoms are Swiss... And electrons are real gloomy, gloomy gusses. They are negator. And so in order to stop the electrons being too sad and dying, there's something real happy going on. So it's like there's reggae music playing in the atom and that keeps the electrons from topping themselves. God, that was a tedious metaphor for something that we only <laughs> believed for, like, less than ten years. Wait, is none of this stuff the real stuff yet? No. Oh, I've plum- made so many notes. I thought this was going to be important. Shit in no, hell. Oh, I can't believe I wasted some focus on that. I learned that. That's in now. And now I'm going to remember that one and not the next one. Of course you're going to remember that one. It's called the plum pudding model. It's Why so did we just exciting. say that that one's true? Because it doesn't really matter overall, does it? Oh, man. Like... <laughs> <laughs> can't, can't, right, OK. So the plum pudding isn't true. <sighs> yes, plum pudding, not true. Not true. A, a man, it was replaced man... by the waffle in a blender theory. No. <laughs> it was replaced... Um, so there was a guy called Rutherford... I know Rutherford yeah. because one of the colleges at my university was called Rutherford College. We had Your Darwin. University had colleges. Yeah, not like they were more like where you lived. We had Darwin, Rutherford, Elliot, Keynes. Who are Elliot and Keynes? T. S. Eliot, and mm. I want to say John Keynes. Keynes. He was a mathematician. Um, Rutherford, can't remember what his name with was. Margaret. Um, he had a team who, which included um, Geiger of the Geiger counter fame. Uh, they decided to shoot radiation at a very, very thin piece of gold foil to see what happened. 
Sure, why wouldn't you? Because basically, if the um, if the world really was made out of plum puddings, they'd have <laughs> expected the particles to just cruise straight through the foil in a straight line, basically, which most of them did. But one in eight thousand particles bounced back. So, well. Rutherford is quoted with saying, It was quite the most incredible event that has ever happened to me in my life. It was almost as incredible as if you'd fired a 15-inch shell at a piece of tissue paper and it had come back and hit you. Was it, though? I don't believe you. (laughs) What is the point of these bouncy things coming back off some gold? Who cares? Who would ever have cared if these idiots hadn't wasted their day doing this? What everyone? It's the it's the basis of atomic theory. Well, what does atomic theory do? I just think science. We should just leave it alone. Stop it. Stop looking for more ways to kill each other. So anyway, so they work. <laughs> right. So stuff's bouncing back off the gold. Yeah, they worked out that. Um, they worked out from. The- this that the mass of an atom was concentrated in the very center of the atom how the, the nucleus, fuck did that, they work that out from that and that the nucleus was charged don't just ignore because, questions that you don't like right, no but yeah let me finish the sentence because then i can explain it all in in a wanna okay um <laughs> So, um, the well, because because some of them just cruise straight through, mm-hmm. but then other ones bounce back. Mm-hmm. So, it, like, rather than the mass being kind of uniformly spread out, it must be concentrated in small bits that were charged and pinging them back. Because it didn't get through in some bits, but it got through in others. <laughs> I haven't got a clue what you're talking about, Ron. <laughs> Not a clue. What? Is, right, here's my best explanation of what you've just said. Um, there's a sheet of gold, and they fired loads of invisible things at the sheet of gold. Some of them came back, therefore that must mean some things have high density. So uh, why they use gold is because gold's a very soft metal. So you can, you know, gold leaf, you can roll out really, really thin. So it's as close to, like, only a couple of atoms thick as possible, basically. Right. So they did that. They have as thin as you can gold. And then if the gold was made out of just uniform plum puddings, these radiate this radiation, the bullets that they're shooting at it, they'd have just smashed right through all of the particles would have gone um, through and hit the Gaga counter straight um, on the other side. But because of the um, because of the shape of the atoms, because their density was charged and concentrated in one point, when one of the bullets hits that, because it's concentrated, what? It bounces back. Fuck off! This doesn't make any sense. All right, think about it this way. How do they know okay. there's not just holes in the gold? Because it bounces back. Think about the bouncing back. Yeah, <laughs> but loads of them didn't. So how do they know the ones that didn't just boop through holes in the gold? Maybe they rolled it out bad. Because going through is what they'd expect if it was plum pudding. So they've proved that it's not plum pudding because some of them get bounced back. Hole of the gold does not affect that. I think we've spent long enough on this now. Yeah, I was worried we wouldn't have enough content for this episode, but... <laughs> Apparently not. Okay, so uh, the next step in the evolution of all this stuff. um, Danish Niels Bohr, sponsored by Carlsberg, comes to England and chats with all these guys that worked out this stuff. He chats to Rutherford and the gang. Um, takes all of their papers, chats to Charles Darwin's nephew, um, and oh, I name dropping. Um, he works out that the electrons that are buzzing around the dense nucleus that's charged, yeah, aren't just kind of milling about willy nilly. They're organised at specific distances from the nucleus. Okay. Then Rutherford worked out again, same Rutherford, that the positive charge of a nucleus could be broken down and you could take particles out of it. 
Uh, these are called protons. He'd already discovered those because a proton is the nucleus of a hydrogen atom. So are protons... What, what are protons? <laughs> protons are positively charged particles. Electrons are negatively charged particles. Um, in 1920, the world works out that you can have different isotopes of elements. That means that they're the same charge, same element, but they have different masses. What are you talking about? <laughs> What? It's the same element. What do you mean? It's, what's an it's element? Carbon, sodium, all of these things. Right, so I've got a carbon atom. Yeah. yeah. You, I've got two carbon atoms, have, but they weigh a different thing. And they're thing. different masses. And that's yes, an that's isotope. It. That's an isotope, yep. Okay. James Chadwick in 1930. Fucking, I, just, he, I feel already like I don't like this guy. All he works out is that there is a neutral particle called a neutron in the nucleus and it's the presence of or it's the number of those that give a rise to different isotopes oh my god you might as well be speaking a different language can we go back to cells this is <laughs> this is just blowing i don't understand any of it so i've got a nucleus and that's got some neutrons inside the nucleus and then around the outside there's a ring of electrons doing like synchronized swimming in specific patterns if you yes. take some things out you can make a proton the nucleus is made up of two different types of particle neutrons and protons okay neutrons neutral protons positively charged so that's where the reggae music's coming from right so imagine this right Instead of the electrons being gloomy gooses in the dance hall, bobbing their, their feet to Bob Marley, the positive <laughs> force keeping them in. Yeah. Instead, imagine that the nucleus is made up of neutrons. Maybe they're the sound engineers or something. <laughs> <laughs> the protons, the Bob Marleys and yeah. the whalers. Yeah. Um, and then the electrons are outside side of that floating around in specific distances so maybe it's a seated concert and then the positive vibes of the bob marley music yeah coming out of the nucleus is keeping the electrons nearby they're dancing aren't they in formation around to the music exactly mate maybe we're gonna go down in history one day there'll be a podcast where people will be like first it was the plum pudding method then in 2022 the Bob Marley method was discovered, and we will be geniuses. Okay, but if there's more sound engineers at one disco than the other, that's an isotope. Exactly. Righty ho. That's everything that they wanted you to know about the discovery of atoms, plus okay. a lot more. I just want you to know, next to none of that has gone in. <laughs> All right, okay, so we know about the history of cells now. We know not cells, atoms, and they're different. What else have we got to learn? Okay, so then um, all the rest that we're going to cover is just a couple of the basics of just elements and what they're all about. So um, each atom is represented by a symbol on the periodic table. So, for example, O is oxygen, C is carbon. And you can... Um, and then you can represent uh, compounds or mixtures by um, merging those together. So, for example, CO2 is one carbon and two oxygens, or H2O is two hydrogens and one oxygen. Uh, group one, that's the... Those are the alkali metals. Um, alkali... So, Alkali is the uh, opposite of an acid. So, uh, yes, it is. Um, so, you know, we were talking about Niels Bohr, sponsored by Carlsberg. He worked out that the electrons are at specific distances from the nucleus. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah. <sighs> Did you say the words Niels Bohr to me? Niels Bohr. I don't remember this at all. Oh he was Danish. I Danish Niels Bohr, sponsored chair. by Carlsberg. I haven't left this chair yet. You're saying stuff and I'm like, that was a different lady you were He hung out to. with Rutherford and Charles Darwin's nephew. Oh, I must have blacked out for a second, but okay. Are you looking at a periodic table no. right now? Do you want me to be? Okay. 
It might be easier if you are. Okay. As a general rule, always assume I'm not looking at a periodic table. <sighs> There's loads of them. All right, I'm going to go for this one. I like it. It's nice and brightly coloured. It's got good shape to it. Bit sexy. Got hydrogen just up there on the left hanging out. Lovely. So, Niels Bohr, sponsored by Carlsberg, mm -hmm. he works out that the electrons are at specific distances from the nucleus. Yeah. So, the different rows of the periodic table, they represent each of these specific distances. So, like, one of the rings that the electrons can be in. So, so hydrogen... Like, hydrogen and helium are in the same row, and they're the only in things the in row. their row... Yeah, so their electrons are at the same distance. Exactly, because if you think about it, they're closest in, so it's the smallest ring, so it only fits two in there. Nope. What are you talking about? So the electrons are at specific distances from the nucleus. Yeah. Hydrogen and helium are at the closest specific distance. And because it's the closest, the ring that that makes around the atom has the smallest radius and therefore the smallest circumference and therefore is smaller the columns represent how many electrons that element has in its outer row so row one column one first first ring one electron in it row one column two still the first ring but two electrons in it right <laughs> i just want to say yes so it's over but but no, what are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> right, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. I'd better explain this because it's getting a bit complicated. So I'm going to draw a little hydrogen atom. So I've drawn a circle, a little nucleus, then it's no. got a ring around it, and then it's got two electrons doing a little dance around it. Draw that again, but with only one electron. You said they had it. two! No, I didn't. <laughs> Rewind the tape, Your Honour! You did! You fucking no, did! I didn't. <laughs> oh, that's enough of this shit! You did! You did! <laughs> helium has two. You've drawn a helium atom there. But then why are they on the same level? Draw, draw it again, but with one. Draw it again, with, but with one. Oh, I want to cry. Yes. Now you've got a hydrogen next to a helium. So why okay. are they on the same Dr level if they've got different numbers of atoms, electrons? Because you see, they've only got one ring of electrons. So it's Two not about how many electrons, it's about how many rings. The rows is how many rings, the element is how many electrons. Do you see on the periodic table, each element has a little number, like hydrogen is one yeah. and helium is two. And lithium is three. Yes. That's how many electrons there are. Okay. S right. This is making sense now. Okay. So, everything on hydrogen and helium's row has one ring. Yes. And then hydrogen has one electron, helium has two. Exactly. On that one ring. Then yep. lithium, beryllium, they all have two Boron and carbon. rows. How do you know which ring the electrons are on? Um, so the inner rings are always full if there's an outer ring, if that makes sense. You can't, like, lose an electron from the middle. Now, so looking at your little drawings that you've done again, mm -hmm. look at the um, the hydrogen one and look at the lithium one. Yep. Hydrogen's, hydrogen's the one electron, lithium's the three. Yeah, I actually so, turned my lithium into a beryllium. So I'll just draw another lithium. That is a nucleus in the middle, a ring with two electrons on it, and then one electron hanging out on its own outer ring. Yeah. Um, could you draw a sodium as well? <laughs> okay, right, here's the test. I'm going to draw a sodium. So it's three rows down, which means it's got three rings, and the little number above it says 11. So I'm going to put two dots in the middle and then eight dots. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight in the second ring. And then on my third ring, I'll put the final dot. That makes 11. 
Yeah, so you can see that lithium and sodium, they both only have one electron in their outer ring. Yep. And it is that property that gives those two elements their properties. So lithium and sodium actually react really, really similarly to each other in the same situations because they both just have that outer electron. And it's kind of that that lets them interact with other stuff. Okay, so that makes them open to opportunities. <laughs> well, basically, because there's, it's, it's just one of them out there on its own, um, it's really easy for them to lose that electron. To lose um, it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so they lose that electron. And then because a negative electron has gone away, that leaves what's left with a positive charge overall. Yeah. So then, because they're positive, you know, they're, they're reacting with stuff because they're attracting other things. So, for example, um, table salt is sodium chloride, NaCl. Yeah. Right? But you see the row um, with fluorine and chlorine and bromine? Sorry, the column with fluorine and chlorine and bromine. Yep, row 17, yep. They're only one away from the very right-hand side. So their outer ring of electrons is all but one full. Okay, very full up. So they find it really easy to just like, num, 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 take an electron. Ah, okay. And then that fills up that ring. Yeah. So table salt is NaCl because sodium is just shedding its electron. Chlorine is hoovering it up. And then they can be friends because sodium, the sodium atom is then positively charged. The chlorine atom is negatively yeah. charged. Sodium chloride. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. So they've got a loose dancer. Pops over to the other one. Ah, oh, this party... It's really good now. We got rid of that sad guy. Yeah. Oh, he goes over and sees Toots and the Maytails. It's too busy at our party. Let's go and share one big party. Yeah. So, yeah, it's kind of like um, someone's third wheeling at sodium. Yeah. But at chlorine, they've got an empty chair and it's a bit weird that no one's in it. It's great. Yeah. And then it's delicious salt. Uh, oh. Salt is good. Okay, I think the last things that we need to run through today is just the difference between a compound and a mixture. Strap a compound in. is when two elements chemically react, are changed by it, and then they form something new. Okay. Usually like there rust. is an energy level. Yes, that is a chemical reaction. Oxygen reacts with iron, makes iron oxide. Which is a new energy thing. Energy is given off, which is a new thing. A mixture is when two things are in the same space, but they haven't chemically reacted. They are just two things occupying the same space. What this... Um, Mixtures can be separated just by like filtering or by like crystallization or something like that. Mm -hmm. Whereas something that's a compound, you'll need a different chemical process to then separate those things again. Because when they met, an energy change happened. Yes. So you'd either need to put energy in or take it back out to get them into the states that they were in before. And I think that's lesson number two. Oh my god, I prefer biology. Sames. That's why I didn't <laughs> study chemistry at <laughs> university. All right, Ron, thank you for teaching me that. Um, I'll see you next week when it's quiz, quiz. time. Well, it is over one week later, and I couldn't even remember the subject we were studying. <laughs> <laughs> so I haven't got high hopes for this quiz. All right, Ron, let's go. Question number one. Okay, straight from the syllabus, uh, can you just name a point for each as many as you can of the first ten elements? <laughs> uh, carbon. Yes. Hydrogen. Yes. 
Oxygen. Yes. Helium. Yes. Uh, Think uh, Nirvana. Uh, um, sodium. No. Nitrogen. Yes. Sorry about stupid dog in the background. Think Times Square. Burgerum. Theaterum. West Endium. Broadway. Like, think, R- think Times Square, but think elements. <laughs> Squ- square, squaredium? Uh, uh, um, beryllium? Yes. How yes. the fuck did you get beryllium before some of these? Other- <laughs> <laughs> Ca- carbon? Have I said carbon? First one you said. Oh, damn. Okay. Uh, chlorine? Nope. Um, um, uh, it, the one of them is like if chlorine was trying to make up a fake name to get into a club or something. Mr. Chlorine? I don't know. I think that's as many as I can think of. Six, though. They actually, I mean, you've got beryllium. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Question number two. Can you please, um, in your own words, describe the plum pudding model? The plum pudding model was... Minus points for Bob Marley references. <laughs> plum pudding was like, hey, hey, guys. <laughs> oh, most, God. most scientific models don't really start with, hey. <laughs> hey, guys, I've had a science idea. Um, no. Okay, which I can't remember which way around protons and electrons go. Protons are positive? Sounds like it. Pro, in it. So I think protons were the plums and they like got in a, a little pudding that was the opposite and that's what sucked them in and kept them there. Uh, not far <laughs> off, but the opposite. Um, oh, man. Because if you remember, it was the sad, the sad negative Nellies, the electrons that were in the positive pull of the Bob Marley oh, concert. Oh, yeah. See, now if you'd let me do it via my Bob Marley method, then it would have been fine. Well, I mean, you can think about Bob Marley, but like, you know, you can, <laughs> it's like in an exam, you can use mnemonics, but you don't write them out in. But this guy was allowed to call it plum pudding. Yeah, I mean, as we discussed the last week in depth, plum puddings were just the most exciting thing, so <laughs> makes sense. Um, okay, next question. Can you describe the experiment done by Rutherford et al? Was this the gold leaf? So they had some gold leaf rolled out very, very thin, uh, and then they fired radioactive bullets at it, or like radiation at it and some of them went through and some of them bounced back which proved it wasn't all even that there were dense spots of stuff wow that yes that was all correct great i can't remember what was dense though (laughs) which leads me on to my next question don't ask what Um, was dense The final, uh, the final question for this quiz. Um, can you just describe the structure of an atom? Uh, okay, the structure of an atom is in the middle is the nucleus and the nucleus contains a neutron, which is like... Just the... one? No, wait. However many neutrons it is meant something, didn't it? That was something to do with it. So no, not necessarily just one. <laughs> not necessarily it was just something to do with it. <laughs> not necessarily Astute just observation. <laughs> I'm just not a sciencey person. Um, yeah, and then the um, negative Nellies, the electrons are in rings around the nucleus and the neutron. Um, so when one ring is full, you go on to the next one. Yeah, some some marks there, I reckon. Ne- neutrons are in the nucleus. There's there, are, um, and they do have something to do with it. So, 
<laughs> that's a point. Um, protons are also in the nucleus. They're the positive charge that keeps the electrons um, circling. Um, and then, yeah, point for the electrons being in rings um, or, you know, in layers around, around the atom. That's all good work. By my count, you got 14 points there. <laughs> Okay, all right. So let's find out how many points were available in total. So question number one, the first 10 elements um, is hydrogen, helium, lithium was the one that I was talking about, um, oh, Nevada. Okay, Nevada, yeah. Uh, beryllium, which you somehow got, boron, which I'm just not surprised you've never heard of, um, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, which is what I said was like a fake name for chlorine, and then neon, which is... Times square. Time square. Ah, okay. Um, so a mark for each of those. Um, and then so with 10. the That's 10 in total. And then with the plum pudding model, um, so I gave you a mark because you described the um, the general sort of plums in the pudding thing, and that <laughs> meant that you know there were charged particles in a oppositely charged thing. That you'd have gotten another mark if you would said it the right way round, <laughs> basically. Um, and then if you'd said um, sort of dense spheres, or you know, like the the fact that there's no space. Um, in between the particles, um, I, I'd have given you another mark. Okay. Um, and then for the Rutherford one, you got full mark. So gold leaf or, you know, very thinly rolled gold because it's as thin as, you know, you can get it just a couple of atoms thick. Um, fire and radiation at it. Some bounced back, some went straight through. And that's because, um, you know, some points of the, of the gold leaf were denser than others. So four points for that. Yeah. Um, and then with the how atoms are arranged, so I gave you a point very generously for neutrons, um, gave you a <laughs> point for protons, again, pretty generously, I think. Um, another point for electrons being organized in structures, um, and then you'd have gotten the last point there if you'd said um, that the number of neutrons determines the isotope, which I think is what you meant by has something to do with it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'd never have remembered the word isotope. Um, isn't that like the Springfield baseball team is the isotope? Yeah, the Springfield isotopes, yeah. Yeah. All it's, right. a, it's a clever name. Not a bad, not a bad effort, though. I feel like when we sat down to do the quiz, I genuinely thought, oh, my God, I can't remember any of it. So I feel not too bad at, at that. Well, thank you very much, Ron. I feel very grateful to have learned. Uh, my pleasure. Uh, and thank you for listening listeners uh, if you like what we're doing give us a like and subscribe share it about tell people that it's a silly nice podcast you can tweet us and instagram us at lexeducation and you can email us lexeducation at gmail.com uh, we'll see you next week class dismissed <laughs>